So the, the Affordable Care Act, you know, is creating, it's creating a lot of change. And what I mean by, what I mean by change are things like, we're talking about patient-centeredness, we're talking much more about accountable care organizations, we're talking about, about uh, new payment mechanisms and so on. And, and what are the kind of things that leaders, not leaders, but emerging leaders have to think about when, when, when they take positions and then they, they think about the changes that the Affordable Care Act are doing right now in the U.S. healthcare system? Well, we're definitely in a period of unprecedented change in, in health care, and the Affordable Care Act in many ways tried to sort of tackle every problem we could think of in, in health care simultaneously. And we're going to be living through a period of enormous uncertainty, I think, for um, certainly five years, maybe, maybe ten years. So right off the bat, I think leaders need to be able to function in um, in an environment of uncertainty and uh, uh, amb ambiguity is, is the word, and not depend, uh, you know, not be able to sort of just work against old ways of doing things, but be prepared to try new things and be responsive to rapidly changing um, conditions. Uh, specifically, we're also asking our leaders to be expert in, um, or at least comfortable with a lot of languages they may not have been comfortable with in the past. And particularly on the physician side, um, it's no longer just knowing you know, anatomy and physiology and organic chemistry, it's being fluent in uh, statistics and, and thinking about systems and uh, you know, financial accounting, um, being able to in interpret and apply r research studies. So it's a, it's a wider range of skills, I think, are, are needed. I'm probably, I, I, I suspect a lot of it has to do with the fact that reform is so broad, it addresses so many different areas that that, uh, that knowledge is almost necessary. So for example, you need to know a little bit about, um, about human resources, you may, you may, because you're developing uh, new uh, bonus systems for physicians. You may have to know a little bit about finance and so on and and uh, and uh, so um well and yeah. it's and it's beyond it's it's you know for a, a physician in practice it's moving beyond uh, thinking about just the patient who's sitting across the desk from you or or one particular aspect or one, one organ system of that patient and as we move into more you know population health based models of care uh, you need to be thinking um, you know, across people and being able to identify, uh, you know, issues in a population, not just issues with a particular person. Those don't go away. This is, this is a both and. That actually brings an issue, which is that, that whole issue of uh, community engagement even that has to happen at that point. So before you may be, you, you may have focused only on managing a patient population, and that may be all you care about within your system. Now you have to be you have to play with others, and playing with others may mean playing with other providers, but other, but, but with other organizations in the community. Can, um, absolutely, can, and that may take place in a, in a formal sense, you know, with you know a, a contractual basis, yeah. or it may just mean um, things like working in teams, and whether those are teams of physicians, uh, whether those are interdisciplinary teams, um, it, and it could well mean working with people who are not in medical care. I mean, I, I think of uh, you know the biggest or one of the biggest health issues facing this country is the obesity epidemic, mm -hmm. and that is not going to be solved in the clinic, um, but that's where the consequences of it are going to be seen. So clinicians are going to be, you know, need to think differently about, well, what do I tell my obese patients? How do I connect them to resources out in the community, uh, whether it's around exercise or better diet or whatever it might be? Do you, do you see a change, a, a positive change in that direction? Meaning, do you think that providers, not providers as much, but systems are getting, are getting that message that, for example, when a patient comes in, Maybe what they need is not the clinical side of it, yeah. but it's more connect, being connected in the community. I uh, think um, I think systems are beginning to appreciate it. I think it's sort of a um, they're, they're taking it on with a certain degree of nervousness because you know along with change comes being asked to do something that maybe you don't know how to do and you're going to have to learn. But I think there is a realization that we can no longer say, well, that's my problem um, or that's not my problem and let somebody else deal with it. It's, it's recognizing that, well, you have the whole patient and you have the community to deal with and you're part of that and you need to be, uh, you need to be a, a player in that game. I know, for example, that 
uh, here in New York, when people look at community needs assessment now, right. when, when you're trying to identify problems in the community, it used to be that a, a system or a hospital would do it at the local level. I mean, at the immediate market in a way. And now they have to basically, when they think about that, they have to do it with, with other players so that, so that you have better coordination of care and resources at the local yeah. level. Uh, is that something that you've seen, um, that for example, in the case of Kaiser? Uh, we think on, on multiple levels, particularly on our philanthropic side, um, but we have an increasingly large definition of community. So it, it is not just our uh, footprint of our operational footprint. So for example, um, if we think there are areas where our particular expertise or our resources can be of value, uh, we direct them there. So, um, you know, after Katrina in, in New Orleans, um, you know, Kaiser Permanente has been providing support, uh, not just to the rebuilding, but uh, to the continuing issues along the Gulf Coast. We've sent you know, financial resources there. We've sent volunteers there. Uh, we helped out after the earthquake in Japan and, and the tsunami. Um, so, you know, we've, we've, while we have to do a lot in our immediate communities within the shadow of our buildings, uh, we, we look to a, a much broader uh, population. Yeah, and that's, that's something that is is in the culture, basically, of how the organization yeah. operates. And so well, on. and it's one of the beauties of, of knowledge is that, you know, giving it away in more places doesn't diminish it. Mm. And if that's what you're sharing, you know, financial resources can only be spread so thin. But if what you're sharing is sort of mm. how to do something or, uh, uh, you know, a cultural aspect of, of the way we do things, uh, you know, it doesn't cost us anything to give it away twice. Let me go back to this question of leadership and what kind of, uh, skills, knowledge, competencies are required to do well. What, I mean, it, obviously it's impossible for one person to, to, to know it all when it comes to, yeah. to uh, um, being the leader of, of an organization because, because so much knowledge, so many things you would have to learn that is impossible. How, can, can you comment a bit on, on, the, on, on sort of like, how do you go about it in terms of knowledge that you accumulate versus knowledge that that you may get from from finding the right the right yeah. kinds of people to work around you. Um, I tend to think in terms. I tend to think about it in terms of like I, I accumulate the general knowledge and then I get specialists to do certain tasks. So how how I, I think that's a great way to yeah. think about it. I mean, in, in healthcare in particular, the amount of knowledge or, or at least data that is being generated mm -hmm. on a daily basis is overwhelming. I mean, just mm -hmm. in clinical care, you can't keep up with uh, the journal publications, but it goes well beyond clinical care and it gets into management and mm -hmm. uh, you know all aspects of of health. Um, I think you know one of the issues is not being afraid uh, of being the um, you know the dumbest person in the room so to speak um, you know the, the being being a generalist is actually a real skill and uh, you know the ability to know what the problem is and what it takes to solve it and how to get the resources whether they're intellectual or financial uh, to do that um, being sort of one person who's extremely uh, you know, capable of figuring out a problem, but not uh, capable of marshalling the, the people to, to solve it, uh, that doesn't get you very far. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting point. Yeah, I've seen uh, many people struggle with that because it's, it's easy, especially if you're young at the beginning, like you're, you're just, at, when you have just finished your career, for example, yeah. where you were taught basically to do everything and then over time you have to learn about how to delegate and, and I, I think to get that's, something done. I think that's particularly pronounced in medicine where yeah. physicians are um, taught very early on to be sort of all-knowing and I, I don't want to say all-powerful, but um, it, it, it was historically a discipline that was very self-reliant and the circumstances that today's physicians face just, you're, you're not going to be successful on your own and why not leverage all of the other talent that's out there and all of the other brain power? And I think that's happening when you look at, for example, people that take uh, positions of leadership in healthcare, be people with an MBA, an MHA degree, and so on. They, the the uh, the focus. I used to run an MHA program, mm -hmm. so I know about this. The focus uh, has shifted more towards general knowledge. In fact, uh, uh, students, for example, are not taught. Uh, they don't focus in specific disciplines. They focus on acquiring competencies connected to that would make them a leader yeah. over time and that's 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 where you know that train is well the internet has changed things so dramatically um, 
you don't need to know the answers anymore. You can find the answers. Yeah. I mean, I was listening to this. It's the ability to find it, basically. And it's the ability to ask the right question, to know where to look. Yeah. Um, but I heard something on an NPR program over the weekend, and somebody was talking about they didn't know any of their friends' phone numbers. <laughs> They didn't need to know that because they just touch their name on the phone and it, and it dials them. Uh, there's a whole lot of things that you could, you know once upon a time could have been taught in uh, in medical school or any any you know professional program, but you don't need to remember those. The, those are out there. You just need to know where to find them. But more you know the the, the, the bigger. Um, bigger skill, I guess, is knowing where to look and when to look for it. And, yeah. and that's harder to teach. Um, that's, you know, that's a little bit more innate. Yeah. You touched on a topic earlier, which I, I wanted to ask you about, which was um, something that everybody's talking about in every sector, which is big data, and basically how massive amounts of information are being collected on people and how that information is being used, yeah. basically. To, to improve care, to basically achieve the triple aim and so on. Can you, can you, uh, can you talk a little bit about that, yeah. about how uh, big data is changing, for example, the way systems are operating in general or, or well, I, I think of two examples. Um, first of all, in, in healthcare, uh, we have historically been so bad with small data and the bar is so low that um, any use of data in solving problems, you know, may not be as sexy as big data, but uh, we can make a lot of advances with um, some fairly straightforward steps. So, I'll give an example at, at Kaiser Permanente: our um, total joint registries. Um, we record when we do a hip replacement or a knee replacement. We know which device was put into which person by which orthopedic surgeon, and we can track um, revision rates over time and and, and outcomes over time. And we can learn, you know, which devices are working better than others, or at least we can have the, the hypothesis of which are working better than others. We can see which surgical techniques are working better than others. It's not rocket science. It's just a matter of taking advantage of the fact that you have a fairly large population. Um, it's a frequently performed procedure, and documenting what you've done. Um, that's pretty, actually pretty exceptional in this country because most people are getting their uh, knee replacement and nobody's bothered to sort of barcode what, um, what device was implanted in them. I think there's also, um, on the cutting edge, uh, the sort of the real big data, whether it's in genomics um, or, or other areas, um, we're on the cusp of being able to do a whole lot of um, you know, innovative development and, and therapeutic development that we just haven't been able to do in the past. Much more something closer to personalized medicine. Mm -hmm. you know, I think the, the hype wave is still well ahead of the reality wave, mm -hmm. but there's no doubt that we can do a lot more now with um, information that just didn't even exist five years ago. I mean, the, ex the examples that I've been most, most aware or interested in ha have to do with things like uh, hospital readmissions, for example, and how to, uh, or, or for population health management. Yeah. But in that case, um, not only using information that you may have, say, at the hospital level, but also information that you may have from the community where people are being discharged yeah. and so on. Um, I think a good example that I saw was uh, um, uh, in Dallas, one of the hospitals there is using, would use information like whether the person moved or not, or, or you know, change their address as a risk mm -hmm. factor to predict readmissions. Basically, it shows some level of instability in yeah. that person's life. Uh, but there are also other creative ways of using data to, to predict readmissions. There, so. there are no shortage of creative ways. It's it's a matter of. Um, collecting the data and sort of getting it um, into one place, so to speak. And then it's having um, a, a system that, that can take action on that data. You know, a lot of what we know how to do um, doesn't get done simply because you know n nobody's sort of in charge, um, and and each could say, well, I'm only taking care of th this patient's asthma, and I'm only taking care of this patient's you know congestive heart failure, and I'm only taking care of something else. But instead, if if you have a system where you know any but any provider, whether it's a physician or a nurse practitioner, um, has access to the information. Um, you know, you can tell whether your patient is due for a mammogram or not, and it doesn't matter if you're just the allergist, yeah. right? Do you think? Do you think the problem is then with? So the data is there. Then the data is generated, is collected, is it's it's stored somewhere. 
but it may well, I think, be I used think mostly it's not collected. It's, it's not collected. Or it's collected by different um, entities yeah. for different purposes, and so it's a matter of getting the information compiled and 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 making sure that it's consistent. And, so yeah. how how are organizations going about that? I'm curious about that. How are they? Or do they do they look at it and say? We need to hire talent and expertise to be able to sift through this. Uh, people that are experts in big data analysis that can yeah. look at different data. data well, points you, you, ha you have to know why you want to have the data. So in yeah. Kaiser Permanente's case, uh, you know, in in the past. 10 years, we've invested somewhere uh, above $4 billion wow. to implement our uh, comprehensive electronic medical record. Mm -hmm. And you know, we did that with a purpose in mind, which was to transform healthcare delivery and improve clinical quality. And it made sense as a, a system that um, is you know, wholly responsible for the care needs of our members uh, to make sure that we had all the information in one place. So we have inpatient, outpatient, labs and pharmacy all together. We, to that, we, you know, we augment it with, um, we've introduced exercise as a vital sign. So at an at a office exam, you get asked, um, how many days per week do you usually exercise and how many minutes per day? Mm -hmm. We've augmented it with um, neighborhood data, um, not just socioeconomic data, but increasingly you know, we can bring in environmental data so we know whether you're you know, close to the port, port of Oakland or living next to a freeway. And at that point, you can start to turn over that data to people who are either just sort of sifting through it to, to develop hypotheses, or maybe you're trying to solve very particular problems like you know, why are our asthma rates it's so high so, in this town. I would think that would be the most of the, uh, you know, most of the use of it, right? I mean, at the be there's a specific problem that somebody identified in the system, whatever it is. Yeah. And then, uh, and then, uh, w what is the process then when, if, if I run a department and then I identify a problem, and I go up to you and say, hey, I have. Who do I go to yeah. when I say I have a problem? Well, that I want to solve. Again, I guess the question is sort of at what level is the problem being solved? So. Um, we can ask, um, say we're, we're putting in a stent on a patient, and did we do it correctly? And, and what were the, you know, the, what were the downstream consequences, and were the outcomes good? But we might also want to ask, um, should that person have had a stent put in in the first place? Was, was there another way to manage? Uh, th that condition, and you might want to go even further upstream and say, is there something we can do to help people, you know, live healthier lives and eat better diets to avoid some of these cardiovascular questions downstream? And depending on what problem you're, you're trying to solve, is going to, you know, send you to a, a, a different kind of data collection. Mm. You know, again, at, at Kaiser we think pretty systemically, and we're sort of trying to do all of the above. Um, that's probably out of scope for most most other systems. So there's some basically uh, um, resources that are put into these health outcomes and health services research, I guess, to... Oh. to uh, Because many hospitals don't have many, I mean, in the case of hospitals, many of them, I would say they pay lip service to it. Yeah. They don't they don't invest in that. It, um, it, it's it's not inexpensive. Um, we have both you know formal research centers in, in each of our geographic um, regions. We have uh, a lot of people in. We have something called the Care Management Institute, which is broadly charged with you know searching out best practices and then figuring out how to bring them back to the. You know they may be within the organization, they may be outside the organization. How do you bring them back? Uh, we have sort of informal business analytics departments um, who are looking at quality metrics and, and process improvements. Um, there's, there are things you could do when you have a certain scale of enterprise, but for most hospitals, they're not going to be able to support uh, yeah. huge analytic departments. Yeah. So in cases like that, they basically have to find university partners and so on. And Industry partners to make it work, yeah. at, and it may not work even. And and even there, you you find that so much of what you're looking for tends to be pretty operational and pretty uh, workflow and process dependent. Um, you know, p people talk about well, why can't we just make clinical practice guidelines everywhere? Well, the workflows are different in different settings, and where you introduce them and, a, and at what point in the care process, um, th that has to be you know tailored individually. I'm going to switch now to ACOs because I know that's an area that you you uh, you know, know quite a bit about. You know quite a bit about, and and uh, and uh, what is Kaiser experience when it comes to working with ACOs, and and when it comes to uh, well, that's question number one, and number two is more like um, general thoughts that you may have about how ACOs are evolving and what do you think is going to happen. Yeah. 
okay. with ACOs in the U.S. Well, we're not working in the business sense directly with with ACOs. Um, we view ourselves as sort of the, the country's longest standing and largest accountable care organization, yeah. having been around for 75 years. Um, what we do believe, though, is that changing, moving away from fee-for-service and getting better alignment and accountability between the clinical and the financial aspects of healthcare is very important. And so we devote a lot of resources to um, sharing our knowledge, what's worked, what hasn't worked. Uh, we fund a number of organizations who are advising state governments and, and, and the federal government as well. Um, again, helping them to understand what questions should they even be asking as they're thinking about crafting policies to support uh, these, these emerging ACOs. Um, we're trying to help set appropriate expectations and understand that, as, as we know from our own experience, not all of them will succeed. Uh, that shouldn't be viewed as a failure of the model. That should be viewed as, um, you know, the normal course of, of a, a new and innovative way of doing. But I'll just, I'll just circle back. We, we do think that you know, delivering care and financing care differently than the way it's mm -hmm. done in most of the country is, is an imperative. Um, and anything we can do to su support that and guide it, uh, we, we try to do. What are some of these challenges that ACOs face now? I mean, uh, is, it, is it really, what are the barriers that they face? Is it, is it uh, um, uh, well, part regulatory of it, or? Part, part of it for, um, you know, physician practices starting out deciding to become an ACO is their their business model and their clinical model has been built up on fee-for-service payment one patient at a time mm -hmm. and um, fundamentally at, le at least in the Medicare program that version of the account of accountable care organizations is saying well actually no we want you to be accountable for the total spending for this population mm -hmm. we want you to be accountable for outcomes and quality measures for a population not you know not just for in in single individuals and it means doing your business differently yeah. like one example of something that I never understood when ACOs came about as as their structure with the Affordable Care Act is the role of the community of community organizations within that ACO, that it became more, I mean, at least my perception mm -hmm. is that you may have uh, hospitals or, or, or providers that get together, they form, they sign a contract or create the organization right. and then they, they, they manage a patient population and re to reduce costs, but at the same time, the community, community organizations be, they don't belong directly to it, but they, they provide input or feedback mm -hmm. or so on. I, I don't remember the exact structure, but I know it's, I know they're not part of the equation there. It sounds, it seemed to me like a design flaw in some ways yeah. because many of the things happen at the uh, non-clinical settings. Uh, well, if you're uh, trying to care for a, a, you know, a population with a very high incidence of diabetes, um, you're going to need to draw on lots of, lots of resources there. And you know, some of it will be teaching people how to cook in, yeah. in new ways, teaching people how to shop in do new you ways. Think, have you seen ACOs doing, doing things like that? <laughs> that's, I think that's where the real savings may come. Maybe not in the short term, because I don't know how the contracts are structured in terms of number of years and so on. But because it's year by year, right? I so. think most of the existing ACOs have been pretty much year by year. Yeah. And, um, you know, this, this is what sort of illustrates the importance of having these kinds of organizations, yeah. which, you know, under the current environment, um, you as a clinician, you as a community provider, um, you may know things and be able to do things that could improve outcomes, could avoid yeah. hospitalizations, but if you avoid a hospitalization, you don't, you know, you don't make that saving. The savings accrue to somebody else. Yeah. These programs aren't free. If you don't have the resources to invest in them and because you don't share in the savings, you know, how do you make it happen? And that, that's where the ACO concept comes in. Yeah. But many of those organizations that have programs like that, like if I have a, a program where I teach people how to cook, how to eat healthy, right. how to exercise, they do, they, I take them ex to exercise in the park in the, in the, in the afternoons or something that somehow I need to be able to make the case for that program to the ACO so that they would see. Yeah. It's hard, it's gonna be hard for those organizations to make the case that what they're doing is saving money because they may not have a, access to an economist to, to make yeah. the calculations or something like and, that. And in fact, in many cases, you're not going to see any kind of immediate return on investment and maybe you need right. to do it because it's the right thing to do. Yeah. 
So do you think some ACOs, for example, are doing those kind of activities because they, they sort of know that's a solution, but they don't, they haven't figured out how to pay for it? I, th I think we're still very early days in the ACO movement. And I think right now they're concentrating on the low-hanging clinical fruit, yeah. if you will, which is um, let's avoid hospital admissions where we can do it because yeah. that's, that's where the money is. Yeah. There's, there's some simplicity to, well, that's where the money is, and it's also sort of a simple goal to keep track. Not simple, but yeah. a very, you know, it's just one goal. You well, know, and, so. it, and it's quality improving, yeah. right? So that if you can cut costs and, and improve outcomes, that's, that's an easy sell to everybody yeah. in the organization. Yeah. Medication reconciliation for, for, for polypharmacy is, is another one. Um, you know, particularly in the senior population, when people yeah. can be on 12 to 18 medications, yeah that are working against each other, causing side effects. For an organization to sort of look at that, recalibrate and say, well, what are the five or six that they really need to be on yeah. um, and avoid some outcomes? That's something that an ACO can do that the individual prescribers could not have done. Mm, I see. That's, that's yeah, that's, a, that's a, um, and when it comes to, for example, tracking, tracking that data, for example, readmissions or whatever, do they, do you think that they're at a point where they they're getting the right data they need to make mm -hmm. decisions? Like I've, like if I go and sign a contract with you, we go together in an ACO. Uh, do we get the data from, for example, Medicare that allows us to to be able to track that population, see the progress we're making, and sort of like at least do a decent forecast on the money yep. that we're going to make on this or or save? I, th I think for the most part, the answer is not yet. Yeah. Um, most of the ACO contracts that are out there are based on claims data. Ultimately, yeah. you want to be moving to um, electronic medical records and encounter data and, yeah. and, and outcomes, but it's a start. Yeah. So, so they, they, for example, they, they make an agreement. They look at expected costs basically over a year or expected expenditures, right. and then if there's a difference between expected and actual, there's some sort of ar arrangement that says this is the... Uh, Medicare pockets yeah. some of you, it, and then you pocket some of it. You, you look at the risk profile of the organization yeah. based on, you know, uh, or of the, the patient population based on prior year um, claims, and then, and, then, and then trend that out and try to beat that target. And then do it like that, I see. Um, I, I mean, one, one area that is interesting about ACOs and population health management is this, this idea that um, any new systems or even ACOs, they focus on a on a given population, so if you pick a, a county or right. a neighborhood, you may be focusing on only in only one slice of the population. Whereas the people that do population health science, they tend to focus on the whole community. Right. Have you seen anyone? I think Kaiser would be a good example where they, in some neighborhoods, they have so much coverage that they become an accountable care um, we're, community model. In a way. We're doing this now in our, yeah. um, you know, things like our thriving schools program, where you know, through direct membership, um, you know, we may have, you know, 40 percent of the employees and 40 percent of the students in a, in a particular in a school are, okay. are, are our members. Um, anything we do in the community to benefit them is, is going to help the, you know, yeah. the other the other 60 percent. So that that level of concentration basically changes the focus of the organization because they, they then they they associate that community with basically their member base? Well, I think it starts with what's the mission of the organization. So in our case, we're you know, a nonprofit um, uh, organization whose mission explicitly includes improving the health not only of our members, but the people in the communities that we serve. But even for organizations that don't have that as a particular mission, um, you know, if, if one organization is, is driving improvement, then uh, you know, competition may help in, in bringing you know, their, their competitor systems along. Mm, I see. Um, so, who, who, do you do you see any any have you seen any trends in terms of like how population health management is? Uh, I mean, it become it has become a buzzword basically on how to do how to uh, deliver health not deliver healthcare but manage care in the U.S. So, it's it's. Uh, do, do you see it basically basically becoming the focus in? Organizations outside of Kaiser, for example, that may. Um, I, I think people are, are paying um, a lot more attention to the, the notion of yeah. population health management. Um, the difficulty is that you know, 
fee-for-service reimbursement is still so prevalent yeah. and it, it works against what you're trying to do in population health management mm -hmm. because you don't have incentives to think about uh, the population. You have incentives yeah. just to take care of you know, the, the person in front only. Um, but it's not just the payment system. It's our our regulatory um, and, and statutory infrastructure is very much geared to, I mean, it was developed in the 1960s, mm -hmm. 70s, and 80s around independent providers being reimbursed uh, on a fee-for-service basis by you know, freestanding insurance companies. And so the, the model hasn't been thinking about, but how do we care for a population's health? And you know, it, it shows up in so many different places where uh, even an organization like ours can't do something because of the regulations that are based yeah. on a, a different view of the world. So I think people have made the, the they've made the intellectual jump that we need to be focused on populations. This doesn't mean we're not focused yeah. on individuals. This is this is an add, not not yeah. a not a subtract. Um, they, they've made that they, that leap, but I don't think the reality is following that quickly. How much of it is driven by? I mean, one of the one of the trends that I've noticed is that when you throw a lot of money, and I ask this mm -hmm. question myself in many ways, when you throw a lot of money at a problem, yeah. then people have incentives to work together to, to, to solve problems. I've seen it with uh, Medicaid, uh, the Medi Medicaid waivers in different states where you basically are, in Texas, for example, you have about, I don't know if it's 900 or 1,000, you know, different individual right. programs that have been, that are being tested right now. I'm actually involved in one of them. Um, so in some in some areas, you could pick a, a medium-sized city, which I won't name, that has you know uh, the local county hospital may have 30 projects going. Yeah. Um, you would think that that level of uh, funding is forcing people to talk to each other, to uh, to see how to coordinate care, and there, there's money involved in it, so everybody collaborates. So, uh, do you think that 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 approach? It's gonna, it's gonna work. Do you think it's gonna be a waste of money in some ways, uh, or, or well, is it sustainable? I, I um, think there are, there are multiple issues. Um, one is sort of depending on how the pilots are set up or yeah. the demonstration projects, yeah. um, whether different providers or different organizations even know that these other uh, demonstrations are taking place. Mm -hmm. Do they even know that they should be talking to anyone else? Um, I, I'm sure if it's sort of big enough and relevant enough that you know people will develop that knowledge. The larger issue though is really the spread, which is so once we get something working in one community, mm -hmm. how do we get it to work in another community and another one and another one? So if you don't have the infrastructure to take that idea that may have worked in one town, and to replicate yeah. it in other places and test it, then then that may be a flaw of a system. Well, and it's not it's not just the the, the infrastructure. It's you know the perennial not invented here syndrome. Mm -hmm. um, so you can develop knowledge in one arena and try to transport it to another uh, geographic right. setting, and it's and it's not accepted. It's why we do the clinical trials on the <laughs> same drugs for the same people in, in every country yeah. because you know metabolism is is different somehow in other countries. Yeah.